Hey friends, life is a journey. And it's one that takes us uh, many places and it teaches us many things. And the lessons we learn on our individual journeys and our journey together make us who we are. So you and I have been on a journey for 25 years uh, together. And what an adventure it has been, no doubt. Now, I'm gonna parenthetically say, if I get leaky, don't worry about it. I, folks have got me covered. And I think we actually put some tissues out there in case you get leaky too. It is perfectly okay. Uh, this month, I've been sharing um, in a series each Sunday of the four irreducible minimum and the most important things that help me not just survive, but to thrive during our 25 years together. And these are the four things that if I'm going to say pack your journey for life, take at least these four things. They will help you in your journey through life. We've talked about the necessity of the gospel, keeping the forgiveness of sins and, and the imputed righteousness of, of the resurrected Jesus, the center of our identity and how it forms how we live. That was number one. Number two is the importance of healthy relationships. And we went through the one another's in the New Testament, 44 of them. Do you think the gospel writers wanted to make a point? That healthy relationships are essential for any organization, organism, any community, um, any congregation to survive together. And so we talked about one anothering. Another important thing to take, and although it's, a, it's almost a little, it's less tangible, but it's, it's confidence in God that you do not lose heart. When you lose heart about a marriage, when you lose heart halfway through trigonometry, when you lose heart on a project that you've been working on or you come under some real financial duress, it's, it's a huge strain. It's depressing, brings in despondency, helplessness. Don't lose heart. And we don't lose heart because Christ hasn't lost heart over us. And then today, we're going to talk about the fourth thing, and that's the primacy of love. 18 years, you've nurtured him, clothed him, fed him, taught him, stayed awake at night while he was sick. You helped him learn how to ride a bike. You helped him learn his multiplication tables. You taught him how to skip rocks on the water. And you went to all the concerts and the ball games and the plays and, and the activities. And tomorrow, he goes off to college. It's the last night at home. So you pull him aside and you say, hey, buddy, I have a few last words to say to you. You took her to volleyball practice and ballet. You read countless books to her. You shared hot cocoa and marshmallows together on a winter day. She's grown into a beautiful young woman, and now you're about to walk her down the aisle and give her away to some Neanderthal. I don't think you're in the end with all Evan and Alex. Everyone else is bustling around, and you're in some back room of the church, just dad and daughter. Or maybe just mom and daughter. And you pull her aside because you've got a few precious moments to tell her some last words. The military has issued its orders and your spouse ships off in the morning and to go to some place in the world, some global conflict. And you're sure they'll come back, but you don't know for certain. And so as you, you lay there your last night together, cuddling in the dark hours of night, you share words with each other, knowing that they could be, they just might be the very last words.
you get the call. Dad has died. And you shove off to a distant city, and when you get there, someone in the family hands you a note. It's not been opened, it's sealed. And it's for your eyes only. It's something Dad wrote to you before he died. So you find a quiet, private place, and you break that envelope open, and you read words that you will never forget. Last words are powerful. Last words have lasting impact. So after 25 years together, 1,200 worship services together, over 1,000 sermons, doesn't include the sermon in the boxes, what do I want to impress upon the people with whom I have been loved and whom I've loved? What's the last thing that I would choose to say to you as your pastor? The last words I have for you are about love. 1 Corinthians 13, written by the Apostle Paul, says this. Now, I know you're all going to say, well, I heard this at the last wedding I was at. Matter of fact, I've heard part of it at every wedding. Listen to the chapter here with me. If I speak with the tongues of of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and haven't grown cynic yet, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I have away, to the poor, and I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they're going to pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, or later, face to face. For I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known or fully loved. So now, Walnut Creek, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Where did Paul find such amazing and profound words like these? I mean, the Greeks had about four different Um, words all meaning and expressing love or a specific kind of love. But Paul's definition here is as expansive as it is concise. It's as practical as it is philosophical. I like to think that John, Jesus' closest disciple, passed this down to Paul as he has passed it down to us. You see, Paul didn't know Jesus personally. John did. John was leaning on Jesus himself when during that last supper, Jesus said this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
Jesus. Three times in two sentences. Love one another. In Jerome's commentary on Galatians, Jerome, he's known for his translation of the Bible into Latin. It's called the Vulgate, as well as his commentaries on the whole Bible. An early patristic father, not too far removed from John himself. But he recounts this story about John. The blessed John the Evangelist. Now, he was called John the Evangelist to be distinguished uh, 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 against uh, John the Baptist, right? So this is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, not the cousin John the Baptist. You got me? So the blessed John the Evangelist lived in Ephesus until an extreme old age. Even after he had been exiled in Patmos, everybody has it that he died in Ephesus. His disciples would carry him to church, and he couldn't muster his, um, the voice to speak many words. Yet during individual gatherings, he usually said nothing but, little children love one another. The disciples and brothers in attendance annoyed because they always heard the same words, finally said, teacher, why do you always say this? And John replied, because it is the Lord's commandment. And if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. Last words are important, not just mine, but these are the words that come from Jesus himself. Little children, Walnut Creek, family and friends, love one another because it is the Lord's commandment. And if it alone is kept, if that's the only thing you check off, if that's the only legacy you leave, that alone would be sufficient. Let's pray. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. May we be as faithful in being merciful and loving to others as Jesus is every 24-hour cycle with us. That would be enough. This life is hard. We're told we have to do this and that, believe this or that, accomplish this or that. Lord, may we make loving one another our most desired and biggest bucket list item. And if we did that, that would be enough for you. Amen.